Hello and welcome to the third of our podcasts around the changes in cost of living. Um, so I'm joined by Hannah and Rachel, who uh, well, I'll let them introduce themselves later as, as we go through. But yes, I just wanted to start with um, a, yeah, a bit of a recap and how things have changed since we last presented a month ago. So uh, something that those of you who have seen a number of these podcasts will be aware is that we have run a scenario that predicts how we think each of CACI's ACORN groups will be impacted by the changes in cost of living. Now, I've said we'll update that as and when we see a change, and I think it has now got to the point where we need to update those impacts. So let me put a slide on the screen. You should be seeing um, down the left-hand side uh, ACORN groups and then a series of colored bars. Now, this is the scenario that we showed on previous podcasts. We've changed the colors because our, um, our Viz guys told us that we needed to make things a little bit clearer. So basically, on the left-hand side, this is what we were predicting based on the changes we were seeing in cost of living and what the former chancellor uh, gave in the, uh, the rebates and then the additional rebate to those 8 million on the lowest income. And what we're seeing is dark blue means that impacts on their cost of living over the year will be less than one and a half percent. You've then got a series of lighter blue bars as you got into groups like city sophisticates here where we've got a reasonably large chunk uh, who are going to see their incomes drop by five to seven and a half percent. And then we've got the more alarming uh, reds as you move into sort of a group here within that ACORN group that are likely to see their household incomes drop, disposable incomes, sorry, drop by as much as 25 percent. OK, so the June scenario showed, yes, that city sophisticates group could be hit quite hard because they're high renting and maybe going to struggle if their um, cost of living went up. Now, they do often this group have reasonable sort of access to savings or family money, which means they might be relatively immune. But then we've got other groups that were still heavily impacted, not surprising at the lower end of the income scale. So, yeah struggling estates, difficult circumstances, we've got big chunks here in these light blue three and a half to five percent drops and some of these even bigger groups. So that was the world we were predicting before and that we'd said that the rebates were doing a good job to offset a lot of the problems, but that we still ended up with some risks. We have now changed our forecast with the latest uh, estimates of sort of another 50 percent rise um, forecast in terms of fuel costs that we've also starting to see rising food costs. So even people like McDonald's are saying that they're going to rise their, raise their prices and Primark, I think, even saying they're going to put up their prices. So we're starting, we've upped our forecast for costs on food. We've upped them considerably on uh, an energy and um, electricity and gas. And also we've risen the costs on travel to work because fuel costs, yes, we've started to see a slight dip, but they are still remaining incredibly high. So in short, the chart I'm showing now starts to give a slightly more concerning world. This looks a bit more like the chart we showed before the chancellor stepped in and gave those rebates. So as the headline is saying at the top, the rebates now seem to be inefficient, struggling estates, difficult circumstances, Big groups of people now in that in those ACON groups starting to move into the red shades of high drops in disposable income. City sophisticates are the ones bucking the trend higher up. And even some of those urbanites and career climbers are starting to be hit. Student life struggling. So we are unfortunately seeing that the situation seems to be getting worse. We're obviously going to continue to monitor that. But let's look at some green shoots here. There are still chunks of the population, the ones that are in mostly blue, where the rebates and, and the potential rise in incomes that we've still forecast at being 3% over the year, where those are starting to offset some of the costs. But it's not looking as good as it did before. Um, and yeah, as I say, we'll keep monitoring that. So I'm going to take that off the screen now. And that was just a bit of a scene set. But I'm going to now hand over to, to Hannah and Rachel, who will go into some of the other data sources that we've got. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, it's a bit alarming, isn't it? Some of that data. Um, hopefully it'll get better before the winter. But 
Um, moving on, we are excited to have Rachel here this week, who has been busy working on a new data set for CACI, which I'll let Rachel explain herself. Um, but essentially, we've been looking at observed data. We've been doing a lot of speculating over the last couple of months. And finally, we've got some actual observed data where we can see how consumers are actually behaving and responding to the cost of living crisis. Um, Rachel, I'll let you explain a little bit more about the data set before we carry on. Cool. Um, thanks, Hannah. Um, thanks, Paul. Um, so it's very exciting. We've got a new data set um, that we're using within CACI. Um, it's just landed, so it's this is all kind of brand new data um, that we're looking to track over the next coming months um, in a lot more detail. Um, but there was loads and loads of interesting stuff um, as I started to look through the data. So we thought it'd be great to kind of show you the headlines today. Essentially, what this data is, it's a read of um, half a billion transactions in the UK. So that's um, essentially transactions through uh, debit and credit cards, and it covers about £17 billion pounds of actual um, consumer spend. Um, and we get it on a monthly basis. Now, this is really cool because it's the first time we're able to see what's actually happening at a macro level across the country. And obviously, um, we're looking at that by ACORN so we can understand the different impacts that different demographic groups are having to deal with um, as a result of this cost of living crisis. Um, at the moment, we're looking at a kind of a broad category level, mainly focusing around essential and non-essential spend, but there's loads more to come on this, um, looking at how people are uh, changing their brand behaviour, how people are going to be shopping in different locations um, and a whole host of stuff. So as I said, these are just kind of initial headlines, but there's loads more to come um, as we go forward. Sounds like a really cool data set. Um, yeah, it's so exciting. Guess, yeah, definitely. Um, so I saw a news article uh, this week around Ofgem saying that they were going to have to start reviewing energy cap prices every three months, which was probably alarming for many, my energy bills have soared over the last three months and as have many across the country. Have you had any insight towards kind of how people spend on energies changed um, now that we finally got that data in? Uh, yeah, of course. So um, through Spend Dimensions, which is the product, essentially what we've been doing is we've been looking at uh, June this year, so uh, what's happened in June 2022 versus what happened in June 2021, so a year ago in terms of energy bills. Um, what we're seeing at the moment is that there's been an increase in, in monthly spend um, around 40 with 40% growth across all demographic groups within gas and electric bills. Um, so yeah, significant increase, especially during kind of a summer month, for example, where people are typically spending less on energy um, yeah, obviously for obvious reasons. Um, so obviously worrying as we get through um, to the winter, um, I kind of saw that the Financial Times reported that they're kind of expecting to see bills soar by 65% in winter, over winter. So it would just be interesting to keep tracking that. The really interesting point on this is that it does vary by demographic group. So you, we see your affluent achievers there, the increase has been the most significant. So their spend has gone up monthly by 49%, so almost 50% increase. Whereas your less affluent groups, so for example, urban adversity groups have increased their energy bills by 26%. So you might think that's really interesting that um, kind of change or um, how it changes between different demographics. But I think it shows how one potent, one kind of explanation is potentially how cautious those less affluent groups are. And they're really, really trying to cut back on those fuel prices. And it's just kind of worrying in terms of thinking about what det detriment that's going to have um, to their kind of quality of life, um, etc. Um, but also, I think a lot of those consumers on long term fixed contracts and actually, they're going to really start to see the impact significantly, significantly over winter. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what we saw um, on yeah. the gas and electric bit. I think I saw a stat somewhere that said that 44 percent of people still haven't felt any change because of those fixed rates, which is kind of alarming because obviously we've yeah. already heard about people lighting open fires in their living rooms rather than putting the heating on. And, you know, the kind of real human impact of those price changes. So it's. It's worrying. Um, dare I ask about petrol prices? Um, yeah, so 
petrol as well as transportation um so kind of we've looked at both categories so transportation covers can um train fares etc um so both of them have increased so petrol spent has gone up by 26 percent um year on year um, and transportation by 20 percent year on year now that doesn't change by acorn group so that is impacted kind of at a similar amount for everyone across the board i guess if you think about the way people travel they just have they have to do it people don't get a lot of people don't get a choice in terms of oh i don't have to go to work so i'm not safe so i'm going to save that money on petrol so it's very few people that get that kind of opportunity so um yeah yes it has increased significantly but the message is it's increased for everyone okay that's interesting um what about another essential goods which is supermarkets i've seen um i don't know if anyone's been watching any adverts this week but aldi and sainsbury's are at each other's throats in terms of um price comparisons it's quite interesting everyone's clearly going for that value message at the moment but have you seen that change in terms of um supermarket spend yeah so supermarkets are really interesting one what we what what's really cool about this data is we can not only look at spend but we're able to look at transactions and average bas essentially basket sizes or transaction values um so it gives us a really interesting dynamic in terms of a view and like the dynamic of how people are shopping um so if we just look at june this as in like almost the last month um, and compare it to January this year, what we've seen is that total spend in grocery is up 10%. So a lot of that will be kind of through inflation, but um, also around kind of people generally spending more. But interestingly, average transaction value hasn't increased and it's actually um, slightly down. So people's baskets are, are lower in terms of what they're spending. To me, that shows kind of a really interesting customer mind frame. So an example being um, people are going to do their big shop and, and in their big shop, they're spending the same amount as they would pre cost a living crisis because they're thinking, oh, I'll probably trade down. Um, I won't buy as much food. Um, I'll trade down the tiers in the supermarket. So they'll, they'll kind of buy basics, for example, rather than, um, I don't know, in Sainsbury's taste the difference. Um, so you'll see kind of that dynamic where people are really trying to cut down their big shop spend. But the impact on that, and I'm definitely guilty of doing that, is then they realise that they haven't bought enough food and then they go and for me, there's an M&S literally down the road and I'll just go and buy the cheese that I forgot to buy in Sainsbury's or didn't want to buy at the time because I'd already reached my budget for the week, um, as it were. So I think that's that's the dynamic. So that's really interesting that people are seeing their kind of probably big shops as they're doing really well and kind of keeping them low. But the impact of that is people then start spending more on those top up shops. Really interesting. Um, how about non essential items then? So we've talked a lot about the essential things that everyone needs to spend money on. So presumably everyone experiences come some kind of effect from them. But what about those things that people don't have to buy um, and how that's kind of impacted different consumer groups? Yeah, so I think with the essential, so your gas, electric, your um, transportation and grocery, although there are differences between Acorn groups, like it has impacted everyone um, from at a significant level and there's no kind of hiding from that. It's imp impacting everyone's bills gone up, everyone's transportation costs have gone up, um, everyone's spending more on the supermarkets. They're kind of essential things that people need. What's really interesting is when you start, start to look at those discretionary spend items and the difference, I guess, in Acorn Group and the difference in demographics. So I'm just going to share my screen. Can you guys just see that? Yeah. So what we have found is this is year on year change in non essential spend. So that's everything from going out to dinner to, um, fashion items through to spas salons etc this looks at the the year on year change um by demographic you can see here the correlation essentially between affluence and the impact that kind of the cost of living has had on non-essential spend so we see that your affluent group so um your um, affluent achievers and your rising prosperity groups are seeing growth in their non-essential spend. Remember, this is looking at coming out of um, lockdown last year, but it's all relative in terms of 
I guess understanding the demo the differences in the demographics but you start to see that the decrease in non-essential spend really comes from those um, financially stretched and urban adversity groups and that's where they're cutting back and that's where they're being squeezed um, in terms of their spend at the moment. That is really interesting I think yeah if we were to be as we start tracking that data forward where we get rid of the Covid effect it will be really interesting to see how how that's truly truly carrying through. Yeah exactly. There's a really interesting attitude element that comes out of here does isn't there in terms of who's who's kind of cushioned from this versus who's not and who 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 still feels like they can go out and spend and who's already kind of massively reined it in and I think it definitely corresponds with all the stuff that we've seen in the media about who's already being hardest hit and um who's able to afford food for themselves so yeah it's it, I mean it's it's alarming and it's a bit harrowing but um it definitely rings true I'd say yeah exactly and What's interesting is when you start looking at different categories and how they play. So I've picked out three really interesting trends that I've seen. We like have a whole range of different categories, which I could talk about for hours, but I'll just talk about a couple of kind of key ones that I thought would be really interesting. So the first one being fashion spend is down um, 19% year on year. So looking at kind of across all A4 groups. Um, and that's primarily driven by kind of high street fashion. So um, kind of your mainstream fashion brands um, but it's urban adversity groups and those lower affluence groups that are really really driving that decrease um, showing that they're they're just not buying new clothes for example because that's a, that's a considerable discretionary spend um, and that's what they're cutting back on um, whereas your more affluent groups are yes they are de decreasing but nowhere near the same levels that urban adversity groups are uh, the second one is the catering industry, which is really interesting to look at the dynamics. So in general, it is up versus last year. But remember, June last year, we were, although we could go to restaurants and stuff like that, there were restrictions still in place. And especially within kind of bar, pubs, bars and clubs, um, there were definitely still restrictions. So we are still seeing an increase and that's unsurprising. But again, there is massive dispar disparity between a those acorn groups. City sophisticates, which are the group that you'd expect to, we've always known that we normally expect them to be spending loads on F&B, they're really engaged with it. We're actually seeing them decrease their spend um, in kind of restaurants, which is really interesting. Um, and I think across all catering as well. So they're down minus 4% versus June last year, which is a real statement considering that you weren't really allowed to do everything back then. Um, so that so that kind of although I guess there are ways that kind of those city fiscal groups are spending more in other non-essential items restaurants is one of those so they've started to decrease their spend on slightly um, and I think we've talked about this before but it might be that they still go out for dinner just as much but they choose to go somewhere slightly cheaper or not have a drink with their dinner for example just to try and kind of reduce spend where they can but they still yeah. kind of want to go out. And that does correlate with the chart I put up that said that is a group that could be squeezed quite a lot. So yeah, yeah exactly. interesting to see we're actually seeing that carrying through on the what yeah. actually is happening rather than what we speculate. Yeah, exactly. And the group that is seeing significant growth in catering are your affluent achievers. They're up in cafes, pubs, bars and restaurants. So they're still spending money. They're still going out. Um, so I guess that's they're not they're definitely not feeling the impact as much at all. Um, the most interesting category we looked at though was health and well-being and I think this really kind of struck me as something that was really interesting because of how much it varied and it also represents that I guess health and well-being is very it's almost indulgent in a in a way but also a necessity in life so thinking about like getting your hair cut, buying beauty, buying kind of not beauty, like not beauty products, but um, hygiene products, for example, those kind of things are really important for our personal, um, physical and mental kind of well-being. And the way that, that it differs between Acorn Group is quite stark. So health and well-being as a category is flat versus last year. So in general, we're spending the same amount. Affluent achievers and rising society groups are spending 4% more on health and well-being versus last year. So they're increasing their spend on healthcare providers, gyms, beauty product, products, salons and spas. So they're really kind of thinking, OK, it's a bit of a tough time. Let's treat myself and go and get my nails done or um, 
let's I need to keep going to the gym for example because that, because that keeps me kind of happy and keeps me going um I think for me that's definitely kind of an area that I would want to still kind of invest in because again it's kind of one of those things that it does kind of keep happening at a time where it's kind of probably harder um but also you kind of see that kind of if they still have some money they can still spend on that they're not squeezed enough yet to kind of get rid of those kind of salon trips um beauty product trips but the less affluent groups are decreasing spend um in beauty um so and that's driven essentially by beauty salons and also products um so they're not going to salons and they're also not kind of buying beauty products so I guess my question is, does that actually start to represent the detriment that people this this like crisis is having on people's personal well-being? I think that massively exposes another type of health inequality that we are likely to see kind of grow going forward as as how much people can afford to pay on stuff polarizes massively. So that's that's a really interesting point, actually. Um, yeah, really interesting. Um, yeah, also, like it's generally what what we saw kind of in the generally in the last session as well and when times are tough is we've noticed this on things but something like beauty is actually a lower price point so typically if people are um i guess a bit worried about money they'll still buy beauty products because it's a bit of a treat um but it's not really really expensive like buying a new dress for example um so we tend to see kind of categories like that doing well so the fact that they're decline that it's declining significantly in lower affluent groups that kind of shows the impact that this crisis is having. Yeah, absolutely. OK, and any other key points that you want to raise or do we have to save them for another day? There's so much, Paul, but yeah, okay. I think that's it for today. OK, <laughs> no, that's day, brilliant. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, I'm very conscious that, yeah, the new spend dimensions data is an opportunity to really unpack a whole load of this. So what we've agreed is we're going to invite Rachel back to be our guest star in two months time where we'll have had a chance to look into this data in even more depth. And yeah, what we're able to start to do is even unpick that by sort of brands that people are shopping at and, and the likes. So we really look forward to catching up on that. Next month, we will be having our next round of survey data um, will have been captured by then. So we will be able to actually get real understanding of people's uh, opinions. Um, so yeah, that's really exciting opportunity and we're also going to we've moved forward our survey after that so that we can get a sort of in november at risk of talking about christmas already we can get a pre-christmas view on how people's views and opinions are changing so that's the next few months lined up hopefully you found the session useful today thank you to rachel and thank you to hannah and enjoy the rest of your day thanks paul thanks everyone bye bye